always a joy to have those who have shared with us in the burden of the work here in days gone by, return and be with us. I've asked Brother and Sister Foote to sing for me this morning our Savior's message in John 14, 1 to 3. Uh, it is the subject of our meditation this morning.
that where I am, there ye may be also. I want to study three texts this morning with you that breathe this longing desire of the Savior's heart that we may be with him. This is one of them. This was spoken, you remember, at the close of the Last Supper as they were still seated at the table. Just a few days before, he had expressed a similar thought as recorded in John, the 12th chapter, and the 26th verse. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. We follow him here, we shall follow him there. We share with him here, we shall share with him in glory. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. And again, turning to the 17th chapter of John, the 24th verse. As he knelt on the threshold of Gethsemane, and there in earnest tones, interceded with his father for his church, the great longing of his heart was poured out in these words, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. John 17:24. Now, in commenting on this, we have these beautiful words from the Spirit of Prophecy as found now in Volume 5 of the Commentary, page 1148. Oh, how the Divine Head longed to have His Church with Him. They had fellowship with Him in His suffering and His humiliation. And it is his highest joy to have them with him to be partakers of his glory. Christ claims the privilege of having his church with him. I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am to have them with him is according to the covenant promise and agreement with his father. You see, this is something that's been on his heart a long time. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. It was our Lord's plan to repopulate heaven with the members of the human family to fill the vacancies that Lucifer and those who revolted with him had left. If after Adam and his descendants had been on trial and proven faithful, they could fill those vacancies, it would make the Father's heart and the Son's heart eternally happy. That was the plan. It's still the plan. It will be carried out. Thank God, friends. Where I am, Jesus says, there my church will be. It is the one object on earth dear to his heart. And he has set his heart on the fulfillment of that eternal purpose. And you and I share in that this morning. You know, it's nice to think that somebody loves you that much, isn't it? 
Let's just revel in it, friends, for it's true. And God means for us to enjoy it, not just when he comes. But right now, you remember in the communion service that he had just given to the disciples. He gave them something to link that service as they should repeat it from time to time with the coming reunion. As he passed the cup, he said, Verily I say unto you, I will not drink of this till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know how it is at home. Just now the holiday season all over the land. Preparations are being made in many homes for homecoming. Somebody that's been away is coming home for the holiday. Well, what does mother do as she prepares? Why, she thinks of something specially nice that Harry likes or that Alice likes. And she fixes that and she puts it in a special place and says, now, don't anybody touch this. We're saving this till Harry comes home. We're saving this till Alice is here. Isn't that right? Yes. Love loves to please. And love loves to be together with those it seeks to please. And so Jesus, there in heaven, is longing that we shall be with him. And every time we eat the bread and drink the wine here in the service of communion, as the Savior looks down in tender love upon the scene, his heart reaches out with earnest longing for that day of reunion. I will that they also whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Over here in the Song of Solomon, there's a beautiful picture of expectation. And while, of course, this Song of Solomon is a picture of human love under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the inspired penman is here also given us a picture of the divine love of Christ for his church. The Song of Solomon, the sixth chapter, verses 10 to 12. Speaking of how Christ looks at the church, the tenth verse is often quoted. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun? and terrible as an army with banners. Now note, I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. Looking over the garden, seeing the fruits, but ah, oh, what is the thought? Twelfth verse. Or ever I was aware my soul made me like the chariots of Amenadib. His heart just went to racing in expectation. You notice what the margin says. My soul set me on the chariots of my willing people. Yes, his heart leaps forward with expectation. And as he goes in the garden there, and he sees some beautiful pomegranate, some luscious fruit from the tree of life, some beautiful bunches of grapes hanging there. He thinks, oh, how John would like that. Oh, how Mary will delight when she sees that. It's real, friend. Nothing imaginary about it is real. He is thinking of us. He's thinking of you. He's thinking of me. I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Yes, 
He's planning for us, and he's getting things ready. Now back to the beautiful verses that were sung for us a few moments ago. Notice how this is the central thought of that great promise. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms, as another translation gives it, many abiding places, many habitations. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. That's it. He wants us with him. But you note that he is so intent on our having the fullness of joy. His mind is so full of the thought of having everything just as we would like it that he says, before you come, I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you. You know, folks, I imagine we'd be quite satisfied with things as they were before he prepared them. Don't you think so? Things in heaven are quite good all the while, aren't they? But love is like that. No matter how nice things are in general, a special guest calls for special preparation. Isn't that true? Yeah. And you and I are special guests in the Father's house. Special people in the Father's heart. You know, there's an expression in the world today, VIP. Have you heard it? Some people in some places get the VIP treatment. What's that stand for? Very important person. Yeah. They roll out the red carpet. 21-gun salute, perhaps. Dinner at the White House. Well, friends, all of that is but a tiny illustration of the stupendous reception that's awaiting you and me. Why, friends, in imagination I can see the angels lining the way and the inhabitants of other worlds gathered as the redeemed of this world march in through the gates to the city of God. It's going to be a glorious day. And all heaven, all the universe is waiting for it. Because all of them, their hearts beat in unison with our Savior's heart. And his heart is set on this thing the reunion of his church here in this world with him. I go to prepare a place for you. Yes, it must be special. Special. I've thought about the personality, the individuality of it. Not some ordinary room but something special prepared for me do you think you'd like a room perhaps a house a home different from somebody else yes I know you would now we'd settle for anything for a place in heaven but God is not satisfied with merely giving us a place. It must be a prepared place and prepared for, for you. That's it. Adam will have his place 
He's going to have the place that God prepared for him in the beginning, but even that's going to have some extra fixing up. You read about that, didn't you? That's right. Wonderful. But you know, I'm going to have something that for me is nicer than what Adam had. There won't be any envy, any jealousy. Because each one of us will have something that for him is the nicest thing in the world. And we'll all be glad that all the others have something that's the nicest thing for them. There won't be any of that selfish, cruel feeling that gets added satisfaction in enjoying something if somebody else is left out. No, nothing like that. That's awful. Terrible. The world is full of it. No, each one of us will take added joy in the fact that every other of the redeemed ones is enjoying something specially prepared for him. And so it'll be. And as we visit with one another, as we meet from Sabbath to Sabbath, under the tree of life, there before the throne, in fellowship with one another, how we will share the joys which we are discovering in our estates. Because believe me, friends, there aren't going to be any 25-foot lots that we're going to have to be cramped up on. We say, brother, you must come over to my place. I've just discovered something wonderful that the Lord had prepared for me there. Oh, he says, what is it? And we tell him, all right, I'll be right over. I must see that. I must see that. But when he comes, he'll say, now let's go over to my place. I want to show you something. And how we will clap our hands as we open our eyes in wonder and amazement. Not yet in this world have I seen or ears heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared. Prepared for them that love him. Yes, prepared for you. Prepared for you. But of all the joys, the greatest will be to be with him. There are glories untold in that city of gold, on the banks of the beautiful river. His wonderful light will burst on my sight, but what will it be to see Jesus? I suppose we've all had the experience of meeting somebody that we loved and something in their manner, something in their attitude disclosed to us that they were far gladder to see us, thought far more of us than we had imagined. Did you ever have that experience? And what does it awaken in our hearts? Joy, gratitude, glory. And so it will be, friends, no matter how much we have entered into the Savior's love here, no matter how much we've experienced the fellowship of his Spirit, there will burst upon our sight and upon our minds such a revelation of his love as we meet him. It will be far beyond anything that the human mind in this world ever could conceive or contain beyond our present capacity. And as we see how glad he is to see us, I'm sure that we'll say again and again, wouldn't it have been a shame to disappoint him? Oh, friends, it would be a shame to disappoint such love, wouldn't it? What a shame to disappoint a love like that that has gotten everything ready for us and planned for us for eternal ages. 
through eternal ages. Oh, what love. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is the blessed hope of the second coming of Christ. This is the blessed hope that the world is dying for today. The Lord himself, no ambassador, no angel messenger, the Lord himself is coming for you yourself. He'll descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Not even death can rob us of that glorious reunion. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Forever with the Lord. Amen. So let it be. Life for the dead is in that word. Tis immortality. Here in this body pent absent from him I roam and nightly pitch my moving tent a day's march nearer home. Nearer that hour of reunion. Nearer that place where we shall be forever with the Lord. You know that prayer that Jesus prayed that we read there in John 17, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. He prayed it not alone that night in Gethsemane, He's been praying it ever since. He's been praying it ever since. I'll read that to you. This is from volume 5 of the commentary, page 1145, Spirit of Prophecy. This chapter, John 17, contains the intercessory prayer offered by Christ to his Father just before his trial and crucifixion. This prayer is a lesson regarding the intercession that the Savior would carry on within the veil when his great sacrifice in behalf of men, the offering of himself, should have been completed. Our mediator gave his disciples this illustration of his ministration in the heavenly sanctuary in behalf of all who will come to him in meekness and humility, emptied of all selfishness and believing in his power to save. What's that? What is this prayer in John 17? It's an illustration of his intercession within the veil. Why, my dear friend, this thought that his church might be with him where he is has been on his mind and heart continually. It was with that thought that he plowed through those dark and angry waters in Gethsemane and met the foe on Calvary. It was with that thought that he died. It was with that thought that he rose again. It was with that thought that he ascended to heaven and refused the homage of the angels until he was assured by the Father that his sacrifice was complete and was accepted and that his church might be with him to share every honor that he would receive. And there, enthroned as priest and king in the heavenly sanctuary, 
he has never ceased to pray this prayer. This is what he asks for every day. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Be with me where I am. He is there not to be away from us, but to prepare the way for us. He is the forerunner we follow after. He is the way shore. We are to enter in within that veil, now by faith, soon in fact, and share with him through eternal ages. Oh, I say again, what a shame it would be to disappoint a love like that, my friend. Well, why does he wait? If he wants it so much, why doesn't he come? For ages the church has prayed, Come, Lord Jesus, and come quickly. How long, O Lord our Savior, wilt thou remain away? Ah, but there's something that must be settled before he can come. The thing that made the separation must be removed before the reunion can take place and never be jeopardized. And what is that thing? Sin. That's all. That's all. Sin. Sin. And so the sin problem must be settled before his glorious hope of having his church with him forever can be realized. That's what he came to this world for, was to settle that sin problem. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. That's why he went to heaven. That's why he's up there instead of down here. There in the sanctuary, through the offering of his precious blood, sprinkled there for us. It is his hope, his plan to eradicate sin, to put away sin, to do away with sin, to make an end to sin forever and forever. Your friends, the only way that that plan, that service, that offering, that intercession can avail for us is for you and me to enter in with him by faith. Let's turn and read it in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Before our feet ever walk those golden streets by mind and thought, by heart and purpose, we must enter in by faith where he is. Hebrews 10, beginning with the 19th verse. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let's do it. What do you say? Let's go in. Let's go in. The way of the rent veil the way of the broken heart, the blood-sprinkled way. And that means, dear friend, in a very practical way, that as we see what sin has cost and is costing Jesus, that we turn loose of it and say, Dear Lord, not only forgive it, but blot it out. 
not only take away the penalty, that is, the execution of the penalty, not only relieve me from the second death which I deserve, but take away the root, the root of selfishness which is responsible for all these sins. Take those things out of my life. And as we receive the blood of Jesus, which is his life and his life is love, that blood will cleanse from every sin. To put it in another way, friends, when we see that loving heart broken for us, when we see how much he longs for us to be with him, and we see that the only thing which can hinder that is sin, our sin, we say, oh Lord, take it away. Take it out of the way. And that desire which he himself implants in our hearts, he is sure to satisfy. That prayer which he inspires, he is certain to grant certain to answer. And to every such seeking one, he says, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Thank God, friends, sin can be taken out of the way. That's all that hinders the reunion. That's all. And so this morning, as he's preparing a place for us. Let's let him prepare us for the place. What do you say? Mm -hmm. I will that they be with me where I am. Thus prayed our Lord before Gethsemane. Tis still the one great longing of his heart. Tis still the burden of his earnest plea. Oh, let us feel the yearning love that seeks reunion with the ones he counts most dear. No longer loiter on the lighted way, diverted by sin's favor or its fear. The pain our sins have brought to his great heart the separation which those sins have made, all shall be ended as his precious blood blots out all sin in those for whom he prayed. And shall his prayer be answered? Yea, amen, that we may be with him. He comes again. O oh, Jesus, thou hast promised to all who follow thee that where thou art in glory, there shall thy servant be. And Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. O oh, give me grace to follow my Savior and my friend. Shall we bow our heads? Precious Lord, we thank Thee this morning as we get a clearer view of Thy great love for us. Thy tender thought, Thy earnest desire that we shall be with Thee to share thy love, thy glory, thy fellowship through never-ending ages. And as we see this morning that there is only one thing which can hinder it, our sins, ourselves. We choose to put away all sin, we choose to crucify self. And we thank thee that as we do this, even now, by faith, we enter in with thee. Even now, by faith, we are with thee in the mansions of love. So keep us looking where thou art, 
living with thee, sharing thy love, that someday soon thou canst come and take us home. Oh, help us to take others with us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, dear ones, we're told, and I'm glad we are told, that at our Sabbath morning meetings, as a rule, there should be opportunity for people to praise the Lord. Oh, I think it would be a shame, shall I say, if after meditating on these precious themes this morning, that we should just have to turn and go home without expressing our love and appreciation to our Lord. Don't you think so? Oh, I'm so glad. There's time for you and you and you to speak of your love for Jesus and your praise to him. I know he's gone to prepare a place for me, but I'm also thankful that while he's preparing a place for me, he's preparing me for that place. And I don't want to disappoint my Savior. I want to be willing to be prepared. Amen. I want to be prepared too. And I read in the testimony to speak that this statement God forbid that we should fail to learn the science of character building. He said some people they all had to sign a golden skull around time and others would hay and the stubble. I don't want to put in wood hay and so on plantation. And you say last night that we should have special time or we could be alone with God. I have lots of time now. I never had it before, but I have lots of time now. So I asked the Lord to let me see what I looked like to heaven. That wasn't very nice. It wasn't very perfect. So I realized that if I'm going to be in a place he's prepared for me, he'll have to do a lot of preparing of me to get that place. Amen. Yes, dear ones, wouldn't it be a shame if after Jesus has prepared the place for us up there and should take us in, up there in the courts of heaven, that we would do something that would embarrass him before the angels and before his Father. And that'd be too bad. We wouldn't want to do that, would we? So we're in training now to be presented at the court. To them that unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I'm sure that when we see what he has prepared, we'll be overwhelmed. And I've thought about it many times and tried to picture myself in that situation and see what that the Lord knows a great deal more about what we do in life than we know ourselves. Right. And he knows a great deal more about what we need to be like to get there than we know. And I'm thankful for the work of grace that the Lord has done in my heart.
and I re-listened to those words, and I've thought of them so many times since. Those young men were singing, by and by, when I looked on his face, beautiful face, wonderful face, by and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more. And then the chorus says, more, so much more, more in my life than I dare to see. By and by, when I look on his face, I wish I'd given him more. So I want to, now that I have a chance yet, before I do look on his face, I want to give all that I have. And I'm sure it's not too many, but I should have. Right. <coughs> Sister Black. My Lord has not reserved all the blessings at the end of the road, but so we can enjoy blessings here on earth. And the climax will come when we can go home with him. Mm -hmm. True, true. If he knew the end from the beginning, we wouldn't choose to be led in any other way other than the Lord will lead us. I'm glad that the Lord is preparing the place for me. I want to be willing to be led by his hand. Good. I'm thankful for this great love, and I want to spend more time each day contemplating it. Thinking of it, so that I will <coughs> awaken a love like that from my Savior. That's it. Thank you. I'm very grateful for this study today. It was, it was just reading in the book of education last night. Wonderful things that are in store for us. We read the Bible, we have the key that will unlock every storehouse. I'm thankful for that which the Lord is going to prepare for me. And I only want to be there to enjoy it, I don't want to. Disappointing here on this earth, I want to show him that. My love here for him is expressed in the things I do. But when we get together up there, we'll be with those that we have both longed and worked for. That's good.
more of a deterrent for me than with my own hurt. And I do love him. And just as surely there's a place prepared in heaven, there's a place prepared for us to work on earth. I want to fulfill my place on earth so I can be prepared for heaven. Good. <coughs> God bless. Good morning for what the Lord has done for me. Many things that He's taught me by His grace. I hope to be drawn closer to so many things in my life and to be a blessing to us. Thank the Lord, my brother. It's that witness from you this morning. I am that witness to what I had to study this word. And even though I have no concept of the happiness of you having a place to pray for us, I hope to see you. You're going to be there, my brother. You're on the road. Thank the Lord. We're so glad you're here with us, sharing this fellowship. His promise plus our promise together. That means three years. To feel a special need of drawing near to God. Perhaps the surrender of your heart entirely and completely for the first time. Perhaps the rededication of your life as you get a new glimpse this morning of the love of Jesus. But whatever the reason, you feel a very special need and call to present. Oh, Hey, dear Lord, 
We thank you for thy wonderful watch care over us, and that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. Help us to be willing to be prepared, dear Lord, and help us to be faithful while we're waiting for Jesus to come. Bless us as we go now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.